Hi, I'm Matt Dickin, and this is Strategic Wealth. Here's a little bit of what's coming up on today's show. Beware of what's called a double dip account. All right, this week I wanted to cover tips three and four from our book. You know, Matt, one of the most fun shows we do every year is the retirement checklist. That's just a little bit of what you're going to see right now. Welcome once again to this week's show, and thank you for tuning in. We've got an action-packed show for you once again here today. In our X's and O's segment, we're going to be covering a topic that you won't want to miss. Our Facebook poll question is going to really get you thinking, and we're going to take a look at a radio show segment that we've recorded in the past that will really get you thinking, and a lot of times it will generate a lot of questions into our office. So why don't we get started with this week's Money Minute. Today I want to discuss another topic that we cover in detail in my new book, Retirement Planning in a New Direction. And we go over an entire chapter where we talk about beware of what's called a double dip account. And when we're talking about a double dip account, what we're referring to are the fees and expenses that you're paying. I meet with individuals all the time where they will say, well, Matt, I have an account and I have an advisor and I'm paying he or she 1% per year to manage the account or maybe 1.5%, maybe 2% per year, whatever the fee is. And a lot of times individuals think, well, that's all my cost. I'm just paying the advisor that uh, fee on an annual basis. They're deducting it automatically from my account. And I think that's all that I'm paying. And that might be true unless that advisor is then recommending mutual funds within your advisory account. If you're paying your advisor a management fee to manage that portfolio, and then he or she recommends mutual funds, you also want to find out what the mutual funds are costing you on an annual basis. Like we've covered here on the show in the past, mutual funds will always have at least two additional fees that you have to pay. You have to pay something that's called a management fee, and you also have to pay something that's called a trading cost, which is based upon how much turnover is taking place within the mutual fund. So if you have an advisory fee, and then you have a management fee that you're paying, and then you have trading costs, when we add all of that together, sometimes individuals are actually paying 2 or 3 or 4% per year on an account where they really thought all they were paying was one or two. And that's why we refer to it as a double dip. If you're paying your advisor an annual fee, but that advisor is then using mutual funds, that's where the double dip comes in because you have to pay the mutual funds their management fees as well. And when, when you start to talk about annual fees in the 2 to 3 to 4 percent range, a lot of times individuals think, well, you know, gosh, don't, don't you have to pay them something to manage the account? You know, certainly they're not going to do it for free. And I agree, you know, obviously there's going to be some sort of fee involved. You just want to make sure that it's reasonable. You usually want to make sure that you are all in, all of your fees combined for less than 2% per year. A lot of times the lower the better, but you definitely don't want to go above 2%. Take a look at it this way. Let's say you have $500,000 in an advisory account, which actually ends up being a double dip account. That could be about, you know, maybe thirty dollars or $40,000 per year that's being lost to fees in some scenarios. Uh, over a 10-year period, you could lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. So a lot of times individuals don't know if they have a double dip account. And when we start to talk about fees and expenses, they'll say, well, Matt, what should we do about this? How do we know? And that's where we can help. We have in our office something that we call a strategic wealth report, whereas if we take a look at your statements, we'll be able to pull out exactly what your fees and expenses are that you're paying. Uh, we run you a one-page analysis that shows you as a percentage as well as a dollar amount how much money you're paying each and every year. A lot of times individuals will have these double dip accounts and they don't even realize it. They think, well, all I'm seeing deducted on my uh, account statement, that must be all that I'm paying. I met with someone recently where they saw that they had a $40 annual fee that they were paying to their advisor and they thought that's all they were paying on their IRA. When we ran the strategic wealth report, we found out that they were actually paying about three or $4,000 per year. So the $40 fee that was showing up on the statement was really just the tip of the iceberg. So if you don't know if you have a double dip account or if you would just like to know in general what your fees and expenses are, don't forget we can help you with this. Don't hesitate to give us a call in the office and we'll be happy to provide one of these reports for you. It's time once again for our Facebook poll. You know, that question relates to another topic that we cover in more detail in my new book, Retirement Planning in a New Direction. 
If you don't yet have a copy of the book, you can visit Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, or visit our website, AskMattDickon.com, and purchase a copy of the book. Or for the first 10 callers that schedule an appointment, when you come into the office, we're going to give you a complimentary copy. If you're not yet a member of our social media community, be sure to go to Facebook and Twitter and join us. We really enjoy getting the feedback from all of our viewers and listeners to our TV and radio shows. And each week, we'll typically post an article or news that you can use to help you with your retirement planning. Stick around because after the break in our X's and O's segment, I'm going to cover yet another topic from the book. You're watching Strategic Wealth with Matt Dickin. It's smart money television. Come see Matt live and discover what millions of safety conscious Americans are doing now to protect and preserve their assets and make up for market losses. Will recent legislation changes affect your retirement? Can you safeguard your assets from unnecessary taxation? Can you find growth and security without risk in today's volatile market? Due to overwhelming demand for these events and very limited seating, we recommend that you call today, 855-MATT-DICKON. That's 855-MATT-DICKON, or go to askmattdicken.com. You're watching Strategic Wealth with Matt Dickin. It's smart money television. All right, this week I wanted to cover tips three and four from our book, Retirement Planning in a New Direction. Uh, those that tuned in last week know that I covered tip number one and tip number two. Uh, tip number one, again, is as you move closer and into retirement, if you move from an accumulation mentality to more of a distribution mentality with your retirement nest egg, uh, now that you're going to need to start drawing some sort of a monthly or annual income, around five to ten years before you retire, certainly as you move into retirement, your strategy has to change. And of course, we covered that in detail last week. And the reason why that's so critically important is it used to be previous generations used to have multiple income streams that they could count on. Certainly, you had Social Security uh, that you could count on. You could count on maybe a pension income if you worked for the same employer for a long time. And then you had some outside investments. Future generations are telling me they don't really want to count on Social Security being there. A lot of companies have done away with pension plans. So your own individual investments, it's now much more important than maybe it was in years past that you really get that third leg of a th uh, three-legged stool when you move into retirement correctly. So again, anybody that, uh, that wants more information on these uh, first two tips, again, you can go to our website and, and view that if you'd like to. Now on tip number three, we're going to talk about the difference between having your money at risk and having your money in a safer position, as well as what the difference between having an active account in a dormant account is, why, why it's so important to uh, make sure that you're not taking risk in dormant accounts. And here's what we mean by that. You know, anytime that you have an investment, your money's either going to be at risk or the opposite of that is your money is safe. Okay, there's really no in between. There's not kind of, there's no accounts that are kind of risky and kind of safe. Your money's either safe or it's at risk. When we start to talk about active versus dormant accounts, if you're going to take risk with part of your money or a portion of your money, you want to take risk in what's called an actively funded account. An account that you're actively putting money into on a monthly basis might not be a bad time to take risk. When you have money that's in what's called a dormant account, or the best time to have your money in a safer position is in any type of a dormant account. What we mean by dormant is any account that you're not actively adding money to on a regular basis, okay? So you take risk with accounts if you want to where you're adding money. If you have accounts that are dormant, maybe a previous uh, retirement plan at a previous employer, any type of, of an IRA or outside investment that you're not actively funding on a monthly basis, you usually want that in a safer position. And, and here's why. If we take a look at the stock market, you know, over time the stock market will kind of go up and down. You know, sometimes the peaks and valleys are a little higher or lower, but the stock market goes up and down. If you're actively funding the account, meaning again, you're putting money in on a monthly basis, when the market goes down in value, you don't get excited that it went down, but you're taking advantage of the volatility because you're buying more shares of whatever investment you might have. You're buying them at a lower price. So as the market starts to rally and recover, you can recover more quickly. When your money is in a dormant account, again, that means that you're not adding money to it on a monthly basis. So when the stock market goes down in value, if you're not actively funding it, you just lose money. And then you have to sit around and wait and hope to see it go back up in value. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So what you usually want is you want some sort of a safety net underneath your dormant accounts. So what will happen is maybe when the market grows, you get some growth. But when the market falls, you don't lose. You maintain. 
then when the market grows, you grow with it, and then you don't lose. That's what you want to do with your dormant account, because there, once again, you can take advantage of the volatility uh, because you have a safety net on your account. Usually bad years are followed by good years. So keep this in mind when you look at your investments. If you're going to take risk, make sure you're adding money. If you have accounts where you're not adding money, you need to make sure that that's in a safer position, especially if you're within five to 10 years of retirement. Now for tip number four, I want to talk about the fact that a loss in your investment portfolio will hurt you a lot more than a gain actually helps you. And here's what I mean by that. If you take a look at your investments, let's say that you have $100,000. And we'll use a real simple example. Let's say that uh, it's a bad year in the market and your investment portfolio falls by 50%. A lot of time, it's individuals will think, well, if an investment falls by 50%, and then let's say the following year, the market rallies and recovers, and my investment grows by 50%, then I'm back to even. That's certainly not the case. You know, again, a loss will hurt you a lot more than a gain helps you. If you lose 50%, obviously you're down to just $50,000. But then if the market rallies and recovers the next year, and you gain 50%, well, you're not back to $100,000 of course, you'll only have $75,000, okay? And this, again, this is one thing that a lot of times individuals don't realize is that the volatility can really hurt you. If you lose 50% of your portfolio, what you actually need to get back to even is a 100% gain, okay? If you get a 100% gain, well, then now you're back to even, okay? But if you take a look at it, when we lose money on our investment portfolios, it takes on average seven years to recover from that. Obviously, sometimes it's shorter than that. Sometimes it takes even longer than that. The longest it's ever taken is about 18 years. So when we lose money in our investment portfolios, it's somewhere between seven to 18 years to actually get back to even. And this is why as you move closer and into retirement, you can't take the same risk that you were taking as you were accumulating your nest egg. You have to move into a safer position because you don't have the time to make up for these severe losses. Even if you don't lose 50%, that happens occasionally in the market, but that, that's pretty rare. But even if you lose 20 or 30%, well, you need 30, 40, uh, in some cases, 50% returns just to get back to even. And of course, if it's taking you seven to 18 years, that's difficult to recover from because along the way, inflation is gonna be eating your purchasing power. So that's why it's so important to make sure that you don't ever incur losses when you're retired. You need to have some reasonable returns, but we can't go through this type of scenario here. You're watching Strategic Wealth with Matt Dickin. It's Smart Money Television. Come see Matt live and discover what millions of safety conscious Americans are doing now to protect and preserve their assets and make up for market losses. Will recent legislation changes affect your retirement? Can you safeguard your assets from unnecessary taxation? Can you find growth and security without risk in today's volatile market? Due to overwhelming demand for these events and very limited seating, we recommend that you call today, 855-MATT-DICKEN. That's 855-MATT-DICKEN, or go to askmattdicken.com. You're watching Strategic Wealth with Matt Dickin. It's Smart Money Television. On a previous radio show, I covered the retirement checklist. It's a 20-point checklist that anybody that's retired or soon to be retired needs to learn more about, and I'm gonna share it with you here today. One of the most fun shows we do every year is the retirement checklist, mm -hmm. and it garners a ton of feedback. Mm -hmm. And um, why don't we get in it right now and start uh, start chalking them off here? The, okay. The, the, your, your top 20, I believe, right? Yeah. We What we did is we put together a checklist of things that individuals should do to get prepared and ready to transition from working and moving into retirement. This isn't part. a bucket list, is it? The, it's this not a is bucket a retirement list. No, checklist. it's a retirement okay. checklist because individuals, as they move from their working life into their retirement life, it's an exciting time, but it's also it's a little unnerving. Individuals are a little scared because you're going to go from working, hopefully you've been saving and investing, setting money aside, and now you've got to completely change that mentality. And you've got to go from saving money to potentially spending money and taking money out of your accounts and yes. using it to live on. So it's exciting, but it can be very, very stressful as well. So what we did is a, a while back is we created a 20-point checklist of things that individuals should do is they're getting closer and closer to retirement, and probably within the last few years, they really want to start to take a close look at this particular checklist and start to knock things off. 
uh, before they actually go in and tell their boss that, hey, guess what? You know, I'm not coming back uh, on the first of next month or whatever the situation is. So we have 20 items. Uh, it makes sense the earlier that you can start going down the checklist, probably two to three years out from retirement, that's helpful. Uh, if you're soon to be retired, maybe within the next couple of months, or, or maybe you already retired, it can still make sense to, to take a look at the checklist and, and try and take a look at some of the items. It's ideal if you did it earlier, but uh, if you're already retired, that's okay. So uh, a few of the main things that we have here on the checklist, of course, is you want to reduce or eliminate your debt. You don't want to go into retirement with having credit card bills or car payments. Maybe the only debt that would be okay in some cases is for you to have a mortgage on your home. Uh, we prefer to have our clients not have any type of mortgage left at that point. Uh, item number two is to create an emergency cash reserve. You know, one of the number one concerns of individuals when they go into retirement is how to pay for health care. So you have all these things that can come up as you get older. Uh, so having an emergency cash reserve is something that we definitely recommend uh, establishing. Uh, you want to apply for financing, such as maybe establishing a home equity line of credit, or, or if you do need to buy a new car and you are going to have to go into debt to finance it, it's not ideal. But you want to do those things before you retire because you want to be able to show the bank that you've got a job, you've got income, you're going to be able to pay them back. Uh, it's not that you can't get a loan once you retire. It's just going to be much more difficult. The banks would prefer to give loans to individuals that are gainfully employed. You know, Matt, uh, I want to let all our listeners know that this is available to them. If they want to call into the office or, uh, or go online and request it, uh, we have it available, and we're happy to send it out to you either via the Internet or we can uh, mail it right to your home. Mm -hmm. We get a ton of people that ask for this every year. Right, yeah. It's a very, very nice resource for individuals to have, again, as they're closer moving into retirement. Is golf on there? Do I see golf? I don't have anything on golf yeah. on here. but How about beaching is we, is beaching we technically might, we, one of we them we might have to add a couple uh, a right. couple of items but we're going to stick with these 20 for <laughs> okay. now okay now another thing that you need to do is trying to determine with your company's benefits that you have what's the best time to retire you know sometimes you want to go that extra 6 months or maybe retiring after the first of the next year will provide you some sort of an additional benefit so you want to ask your HR company if you were to transition into retirement uh, what's the best time? Do you, do you lose anything if you do it one month versus another month? What's the best time? Now, we usually recommend for individuals as they're going from working into retirement to if they can, if it's up to them, to try and choose to retire maybe in the spring or the summer. Try to avoid retiring right in the middle of winter. Oh, I don't want to get locked up inside right after you yeah, retire. Every, right. It's cold outside. Everything's dead. You can't really work in the garden or do anything. You can't walk around outside each day. That, that so. would seem to be key. I mean, you, you got to get off on, on the right foot here. And mm -hmm. if you can, yeah, because I, I think retirement is scary. And the last thing mm -hmm. you want is to be locked up in your home mm -hmm. for 60 or 90 days right. uh, with not a whole lot to do to yeah. make your transition. Our clients that retire in the spring and the summer transition much more successfully than our clients that uh, maybe they, they don't have any choice and they have to retire December 31st or, or something of that nature. Now, if you have to retire right in the middle of winter, well, then plan a trip. You know, go somewhere warm, maybe go visit some kids or grandkids that might live down south or something of that nature. But if you can control it, try and do it in either the spring or the summer. Uh, another thing that we have here on the checklist is, you know, obviously you need to calculate how long your money will last. Now, hopefully you do that before you've officially retired, but you do need to calculate that. Do you have your money invested in a way that it, the income that it generates will last up to your life expectancy and beyond? Uh, obviously, if it's not going to last, you might need to reconsider those uh, retirement plans and that retirement date. Uh, you want to document any email addresses and contact information and store it in a, in a calendar or any special websites or bookmarks. You need to have all of that maybe in a binder. With our clients that we work with, we give each of them an account binder so they can keep everything in one place. Uh, if something were to happen to them, let's say that they're in an accident and they're in the hospital and they, they, you know, the family just doesn't know where everything is, we usually recommend having a binder that's and a what resource. what is that everything? What, what, when you say everything, what do well, you mean? You need to have a resource of every account that you have money on deposit in, whether it's a bank or an investment firm. You need to have the, have the contact information there. Uh, any insurance that you have, long-term care insurance, obviously information on your health insurance, maybe any living wills or trusts. Uh, you don't have to you know, make multiple copies and hand it out to everybody, but you need to have at least one, two family members, close friends that you trust, that they know where to go to get it. 
So you just need to make sure that it's all organized and in one easy place to find. Uh, some other items that we have here on the uh, checklist is decide what you're going to do with your 401k. Uh, or 403B, whatever you might have through uh, your previous employers. You know, are you going to leave them where they are, or are you going to roll them over to an IRA? We recommend rolling them over to an IRA. I don't believe that if you are no longer at your previous employer, I don't think your money should be there either. So there's a lot of advantages of having your money in an IRA. But I'll meet with individuals all the time, Mark, that that they want to leave it at their previous employer if they really like their job and they like the company that they work for. It's kind of that last thing that they hold on to. They know that once they roll that money over, that, that that's it. They no longer have any business or any dealings with that firm. So I get that, but it usually makes more sense to go ahead and roll it over. You've got to decide what you're going to do with that before you retire. Uh, you need to determine when you're going to draw Social Security and when you're going to Man, apply for Medicare. this is such Medicare. a big one. And, I, yeah. you know, uh, we talk about it so often here on the show. And the difference in dollars in waiting a few years, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be. So are you going to take it early? And that should really be determined by are you going to work part-time or do any consulting, things of that nature that will determine typically for individuals whether they should take it early or, or wait to full retirement. So that's something that needs to be considered. Uh, you know, you need to consider whether or not you're going to need long-term care insurance. You know, some people have enough money to self-insure others if either themselves or their spouse were to need to go into a facility or if they just needed some special care in the home, in the house, it can be just as expensive as having to go into a facility. So how are you going to handle that? And then probably the biggest issue, Mark, that I, I ask individuals to consider before they retire is what type of lifestyle do you want to live? What are you going to do all big, day? Big, Matt, big. I want to go you, big. What are you going to do? You know, some individuals look at retirement and they say, well, I sacrificed. We put the kids through school. We did without. This is our time. We're going to travel the world. We're going to do all these things that we didn't have the time or the resources to do while we were working. I'll talk with other individuals that will say, Matt, just as long as I don't have to go in and answer to a boss, I'll be happy. You know, if, if I don't have any money other than just sit on the porch every day, I'm going to be happy because I don't have to go in and answer to a boss and, and work a set number of hours each week. So what kind of lifestyle do you want to have and what are you going to do? You know, once you go into retirement, you're not working 40, 50, 60 hours a week anymore. You're going to have to find something to do to fill those hours. Folks, stick around. we got a lot of great stuff to come. You're listening to The Matt Dickens Show, where safe money is smart money. Now it's time once again for our AskMattDickens.com segment. So, Mark, what kind of questions do you have for me today? Matt, we got a lot of great questions today. Our first one is from Barbara in New Albany, and she writes, Hi, Matt. Love your new book. I'm in my 50s, and I was wondering what age your book was meant for. Was I a little premature to read it? Well, I don't think so, Barbara. Thank you uh, for picking up a copy and, and uh, giving me the feedback. It, it was really written for pretty much all ages. Obviously, those that we work with most often in our office are going to be those that are retired or soon to be retired, meaning maybe within about five or ten years. Typically that means that individuals are in their 50s or 60s, but we work with a lot of our clients' children and, and grandchildren, and I, I think it's a book that can help them as well because we talk about really what you should do throughout your entire life, not just those crucial five to ten years before you retire and move into retirement, but really what you should be doing many, many years earlier, and, and we cover some of the common mistakes that uh, individuals will make with their money, and that can be helpful really for any age uh, that, that, that reads it. So it uh, wasn't really geared towards any specific age group. I think anybody that's uh, in their 20s or 30s can learn something from it as well. So, But thanks for the question, Barbara. Matt, this question is from Julian Bardstown. She writes, I just love your new book, Matt. I especially like the three rules you go by. Keep it safe with a reasonable return and keep it simple. It's very easy to remember. What made you choose these rules? Well, Julie, it's really what our entire firm is built upon. You know, I started in the industry back in 1997 and wanted to share with individuals kind of a, a different way. That's why I chose the title of the book being Retirement Planning in a New Direction. I think far too many individuals as they move closer and into retirement are taking too much risk with their money. Uh, and a lot of times individuals will tell me that they really uh, feel like it's gotten too complicated. They don't know exactly where to put their money, how much income can they draw once they retire. And then, of course, a lot of individuals are struggling right now to get a reasonable rate of return. Uh, obviously, investments at the banks aren't paying much interest, and, and Wall Street's pretty unpredictable. So what we try and do is, is break it down into really three easy rules to remember 
and that is safety comes first. When you move into retirement, you, you, you can't afford to lose any money. Uh, you don't have the time to make up for big market drops. So, so safety has to be the number one priority, but you can't just leave your money on deposit in a bank getting little to no interest. So you, the second priority or the second rule is you need to earn a reasonable rate of return. And of course in the book we cover different ways that you can do that. And then the third rule is to just keep things simple. I think individuals have made things overly complicated. I think investment firms have made things too complicated. The statements are hard to read. The investments are hard to understand. So in the book, we cover ways to just keep things simple, easy to understand. If you follow those three rules and you do it successfully, then your retirement will be much more enjoyable. Well, Mark, any more questions? Matt, that was the last one of the day. Well, thank you once again for submitting the questions that uh, you had about the book. I really enjoy answering them. Of, of course, if you have any questions about anything that you've read in the book, if you've purchased it already, or if you have questions about anything in general as it relates to your retirement planning or investment planning, don't hesitate to go to AskMattDickon.com. I love answering those questions here on the show, uh, but even if we can't get to all of the questions, I will at least respond to you via email. So that brings us to the end of this week's show. Thank you once again for watching. We really enjoy putting it together and bringing it to you each and every week. We'll be back here again, same time, same place. And remember, retirement planning is a journey, not a destination. I'll catch you here next time. I was born and raised right here in Louisville, Kentucky. I uh, started in the industry in 1997, uh, and I started Strategic Wealth Designers, my firm, which is an independent firm, back in 2002. You know, from a very young age, I always knew that this is what I wanted to do. I, I really was interested in being in a career where I could really help people. Uh, and then I kind of had a knack for money. It just kind of became a, a natural progression that I would help individuals with their investments and their retirement planning uh, goals and dreams. So it's just something that I always knew that I wanted to do. Well, I love what I do. I don't, I don't consider it work. Uh, every day I get to help somebody new typically. I love helping people and solving problems and I get to do that basically on a daily basis. I, I kind of view what we do for a living or what I do for a living is one of the most important jobs somebody can have. And it's a lot of fun helping somebody that you know is maybe four or five years from retirement and taking them all the way through until they're officially retired and enjoying it and you know doing the traveling and, and doing the hobbies and passions that they had always helped to pursue. That's the most rewarding thing that we get to do over the course of the year. Uh, we're going to continue to help as many people as we can in the community. We, we built our dream home here. The business is located here. Our friends are here. Our family is here. Our clients are here. We don't ever see ourselves leaving. And I really enjoy what I do for a living. Um, at this point, you know, we're not necessarily working because we have to. I got started at a really early age. I've been fortunate. Um, I, I wouldn't have to do all the things that I do, but I, I want to continue to do the things that we do like the radio show, the TV show, and the educational classes because we want to help as many people as we can have a secure, successful retirement and I'm going to do it for as many years as I can moving forward.